another month has flown by, summer is upon us, so it's time to stop and rank every May new release that I saw from the worst to the best. Now, I only saw three new movies this month, so it'll be a pretty short video. As we get started, be sure to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the May new releases that you saw. My list is not the right list, and my list is very far from a comprehensive list. So let me know what you saw, let me know what you loved, and let me know if I missed something that you think I would like. Like, I really wanted to go see Blackberry. It looked great. I just wasn't able to make it out to the theaters. I was was excited about Hypnotic until I heard the reviews for it, but there's several movies I was hoping to see this month. The month didn't play out the way I wanted it to, so I wasn't able to get up to the theater to see some of these other films that were coming up. Even like Wrath of Becky, I wish I could have seen that one too. It was a weird month. There's a lot of stuff kind of going on in real life with graduations and other things, so there you have it. Let's get started. Third, The Little Mermaid, the latest Disney live action remake. And I, I thought it was enjoyable, but flawed. It's in last place, but I think it's a good movie. I did go positive in my review for it. And some of that is that, look, I'm a dad. One of my earliest childhood memories was seeing the original Little Mermaid in the theater. It's like one of the five first movies I remember seeing in the theater. And now I have two daughters that are under the age of 10. And that's kind of the nostalgia that Disney is milking for a lot of these Disney live action remakes, in particular, the ones that are big hits. They know people my age, we grew up on the Renaissance films and now we have kids. And so there's that generational appeal and it's a cool event to get to take my daughters to go see this movie, a new version of this movie that I grew up watching, and just see them have big, gigantic grins on their faces and have an absolute blast at the theater. So I was able to go to a promo screening where I could bring my two daughters and then their friend from across the street, and they all loved it. It was really cool. But just in general, I think it's one of the better Disney live action remakes. There was a certain like steady hand when it came to the direction and the storytelling here where they knew the movie that they were trying to make. There's a bunch of fantastic transitions between sequences. I thought Ariel did a great job. I know the internet has been lit on fire over the race swapping. And if you're mad at Disney or the director and the producers for deciding to race swap Ariel... That's fair. That, okay, okay. I, I think there are arguments to be made there that aren't just, you're a racist if you have issues with changes to traditional characters. Like, there are other reasons besides that. So, okay, fair enough. But that doesn't mean the performance is bad. That doesn't mean that she did a bad job just because you oppose the fact that they race swapped the character and you're mad at Disney for all of what they're doing. It doesn't mean she did a bad job. I thought she did a very good job. She's able to emote a lot with her eyes. And so she's able to capture that naive energy. But it's a flawed film. It's too long. The original is about 90 minutes. This is two hours and 15 minutes. It's 50% longer. And they didn't really add any major subplots. It's like just everything's fleshed out a little bit more. There's more time with Eric. There's more time with the romance. There's a bunch of new songs. None of them are as good as the old songs. And so it's just more, 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 adding, 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 adding. So it just gets stretched out too long. So it's, it's too long. And then the auto, underwater stuff looks bad. It just doesn't look good. Like when they're like deep in the water and it's dark, it, it looks good. But then it's going to get loses the lively energy of the animated film. And whenever they're in the higher waters and things are bright, it just looks bad. <laughs> it's just, the lighting is way off. And so they could never figure out how to quite do the underwater stuff. So a movie that I, I think works well enough, captures the energy, in particular when they get to the land, when it's the romance stuff, you get that spark of energy that you want from a, a Disney film. But they definitely made some mistakes here. Our runner-up for the month will be Fast X, and even though it's the runner-up for the month, that doesn't mean that I think that this is a great film. I think that it is exactly what I tend to call these Fast and the Furious movies. It's a Taco Bell movie. It's cinematic fast food, cinematic junk food. It's very enjoyable, superficially speaking, but you can't really defend it. My family gets Taco Bell every weekend. My tacos are always soggy. There's always something wrong with the order, but we still love to eat it anyway. That's what these Fast and the Furious movies are for me. And that's what Fast X was for me. A fun time at the movies while being absolutely ridiculous. I think they made some wise choices here, dialing back the crazy a little bit. It's not grounded. It's not realistic. It's still ridiculous 
but there aren't cars in space. Dom doesn't do cars in and swing a car across like a valley or anything like that. It, it's not realistic by any means. There's still wacky stuff he does with a crane, but it's dialed back a little bit. I feel like this feels more kind of like Fast Five, Six, and Seven. I think that's the best run of the Fast and the Furious movies. It goes back to kind of that phase of movies that I, I really enjoyed. Jason Momoa is a lively villain that you actually remember afterwards. Rewatching all the movies over the last month. There's a lot of villains in these movies. You're just like, who? Oh yeah, that guy's in this. I forgot about that. You'll remember Jason Momoa, both because he's got this wild over-the-top performance in a good way, over the top in a good sense. And then likewise, because his character ties back to other movies because uh, um, of his motivation, it's something that stands out what he's trying to do. And even the way it ties into the agency and everything just feels like it stands out. It's a little bit more memorable. The stakes feel a little bit more meaningful than other movies where it's just like, get the spy thing to do the spy thing to save the world with cars. This one, Someone's out to get them. So I, I really enjoyed a lot of those aspects of it. And even the way they kind of divided the team up ends on a cliffhanger. It's reminiscent in multiple different ways to Avengers Infinity War. And I don't know if that's necessary. Like, we'll see how that pays off when another movie comes out. Does, does it expand? Does it make this movie better or worse? I don't know what'll come in the future, but I had fun with it on a uh, first viewing. But coming in in first place, and this was pretty easy to pick the one in first place, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. As of right now, this is my number two movie of the year behind air. Maybe with time it'll move up. I don't know. We'll see what happens by the end of the year. But it is right there up top with the movie air. And I thought this was a fantastic send off for our Guardians of the Galaxy and a movie with a just a whole wide range of emotions that you feel. It can make you laugh. It can rip your heart out. It can make you have tears of joy and victory, tears of sadness as you say goodbye. It has all of it. And as someone who's been pretty critical of the MCU and Disney over the last several years, this is a movie that kind of reminded me of the good old days where it felt like there was passion being poured into. It didn't feel as much like formulaic corporate assembly line filmmaking. This felt like James Gunn had something he wanted to tell and he had a clear vision and that's the movie that he created. Even as you like contrast the statements made by James Gunn about this script, where he said very little changed from what he originally wrote five years ago. Before Endgame came out, he finished his draft for this movie and then he got fired and then he was rehired. All this stuff happened. He said very little changed besides jokes I liked a little bit more. Little tweaks. The story was set. The journey for the characters, I've known it for years. And you just contrast that with statements over the last month from both the America Chavez actress as well as Elizabeth Olsen. America Chavez actress says they had the writer do 33 rewrites of Doctor Strange 2. Elizabeth Olsen has said in the last month, I stopped reading the drafts because they kept changing them so much that it didn't matter until I was on set ready to film. You contrast James Gunn had a clear idea of what he wanted to do. And then so many of these other Marvel projects feel like there's too many fingers working on it. There's too many cooks in the kitchen and it's messing everything up. That's what I loved about this movie. It just had such a personality and it's so many emotions. There's a few wonky things with the story and the logic of why characters do specific things, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I had a blast. It made me cry all the different types of tears. And so... I would say this is the best MCU film since Endgame. Maybe No Way Home is the better like theatrical experience, but this I would say is easily the better movie. So without question, it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, I did reviews of each of these films and did rankings associated with the editorials, all of that fun stuff. You can see some of that, I don't know, around here. I don't know what I'll put up on the screen. Thank you so much for watching. Keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.